Fatih, welcome to Greece again. Thank you. Especially in Thessaloniki. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Thank you. Didn't miss a fast from I know it's your favorite place. Yeah, it's a good place. I like this place. It's a fun place for you. Uh, vibrant, lively, like your film. Let's take things from the beginning, please. You were almost ready to make, as you told me, a mini-series about Malen and Bibli, right? What was that about? It was uh, something that you worked for a long time with Diane Kruger. How, what was that? It was something which uh, was born on the set of In the Fate. Because yes. Diane and I, we became like really close, mm -hmm. you know, as as friends and also as director and actress. And she said, like, I really like the way you work with me and pull things out of me. And uh, I have this dream. I would like to, I would like to portray Marlene Dietrich. And I need a German director for that. And I want you for that. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what she said. And it was a compliment. But then I was like, I don't know nothing about Marlene Dietrich. It's not my world. And I, I do street films, yeah, that's you, why I'm you know. And then uh, she insists. And I was flying with my father to a film festival to Mongolia. And I had this 18 hours flight. And I have a big library on, 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 on books about film and cinema. And I have this book on Marlene Dietrich. So I took the book and I read it on the plane. And then there was one element I really liked. You know, it's Marlene Dietrich, the immigrant, or the woman in exile. So. Marlene Dietrich went to Hollywood in 1930. She left Berlin in 1930. While she was in the States and built up a career, the Nazis took over the country. The fascists took over the country. And she was starting to smuggle friends out. The Nazis wanted her to come back, you know, to have this big world star in Germany. And she didn't want to go, but her mother was still in Germany, you know. So she had to find a way to balance it. And then when the war breaks out, when the war broke out, and, uh, and the Americans had problems with the Germans, she had to become an American yeah. to not be deported back to Germany or not to be uh, considered as a spy. And then she went to the war against her motherland, against Germany, as an American soldier. That's the mother of all the immigrant stories, you know. So, and there's a lot of uh, uh, connections between my relationship with Turkey, because now we have exactly that. A lot of people escape from Turkey, intellectuals, writers, filmmakers, you know, um, normal people. Some of, our, of them are my friends, and I try to organize them. And this is the link, this is the personal bridge I have for the Malin Dietrich uh, element. But it's for my, my, my frame is from 1930 till 45. Mm -hmm. well, that's very interesting. We've heard all the stories about Dietrich being maybe a spy, um, a war hero. Anyway, she was some kind of a hero. But on the side, because this project fell apart, as you told me, you developed uh, the Rheingold. Yeah. Which is about a man who, I don't know if he's a hero, but for some, especially younger people, he's a kind of a role model, right? So this is sort of an ambivalence with Hadar. Tell me about that. How did it come about? I think somehow both are German mythology, both <laughs> Dietrich and Hadar, you know, but on a very different level, different times and different audiences. But, but both are very German subjects in a way. So Hadar is myth in Germany in every ghetto. You can go to every ghetto in Germany no matter where, in which city, and all the kids know about Qatar and the bank uh, and the gold robbery. Yeah. It had become a meme, it had become a myth, you know. Everybody knows about it. So, and it was a plan B, in a way. I, I, I read his biography on a, on a Crete vacation on the beach, you know, but it really hooked me, you know. The, uh, Greece again. I was in Greece. I'm always in Greece. I, I, I you know, I, I like it here. It's okay here. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Greece. You know, so, uh, you know, I was, I was reading it here on a holiday, and um, I was like, this could be a strong film. But I was not sure if I would do it, because I was in the Malini thing. I was like, I buy it away from the market, so no one else can do it. Yeah. Like good football players, you buy away from the market, you know. And 
I don't know, maybe a producer, maybe someone else does it. And when Marlene uh, 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 collapsed for that time, I desperately needed another another film, uh -huh. you know, because and that and that uh, happened. But did you have um, like second thoughts, saying to yourself, maybe I'm not suitable, maybe I don't know about rap, maybe I'm getting into you know waters that I don't know. No, it's the opposite. It, it was the opposite. I, I chose this one as an as a backup, as an alternative. I needed desperately an alternative. It was COVID. Yeah. My company needed money. You know. I have a small boutique company and, and I always have to do something. And then it was the COVID and I had no project. And I underestimate the uh, 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 Hatar project because I thought like, it's about rap music. I know everything about rap music. It's about gangsters. I, my very first film is about gangsters, sure. you know, uh, Short Sharp Shock with Adam Bostukos. And it's about immigrants in Germany. I know about that. So it will be easy. That's what I thought. But it turned out to become the most complicated, complex, difficult, expensive, insane film of all my career. Why is it so complicated? Because it is an epic, you know, sure. and try to do an epic with many countries when there's COVID, you know. It's a jigsaw uh, story. It's yeah. It goes here and there and you had to organize it, I guess, very, very hardly. Yeah, it has, you know, it had all the project, it's an epic, it had 120 locations. You know, I mean, in this, in this, it's more locations in the story, but for real locations where we were shooting, we had 120 locations. Mm -hmm. You know, I had three changes uh, of locations every day. You know, I had 100, more than 100 actors to cast, you know. And because the script was 160 pages, you know, and I just had like 55, uh, 50 days of shooting, I had like 10 days of screenplay I had to shoot every day with all these changing of locations, with this huge crew because it's a historical film in a way, you know. It's not in the 20s, but it's in the 90s, you know, and in the 80s. It's a period. It's a period film, you know, with all the, with all the traps of the period film. And that was like, to handle all that, and my screenplay was, it was not really finished. Okay. Because I had no time, and I had to finish the shootings by the end of 21, you know. I started financing at the beginning of 21. Uh, tell me, this, the, the book you read, you kind of find, okay, easy to read, fascinating story, uh, very dis descriptive, and you met Hatar. Was he consulting on the film? He was consulting on the film. How much of this incredible story that we see on film is true? Well, I think... As a percentage, like an 80%? I think everything has a true corn, sure. a true center, everything. But I didn't really invent stuff, but, you know... I treat it as literature. You know, when you do literature and film, what do you do? You know, you, you, you combine three characters, you made it to one, you made uh, three locations into one, this sort of things. You know, uh, we cannot shoot it in England because it's too expensive, so we put it to Amsterdam, this sort of things, you know? Okay. They like how you treat literature and film, the same thing. And um, you said that, of course, it's, uh, he's legendary in, in Germany and his music and also the Rheingold story. Um, did you, was it the first time you asked, the first thing you asked him when you met him about the Rheingold? Where the gold is? No, I'll tell you something. I'm from the street myself. I was not a gangster, but I was growing up in a, in a, uh, uh, um, in a social hotspot, how do you say it, you know? Um, and uh, where I come from, you don't ask these questions. You know, I learned that on the street. You know, it's irrelevant. Well. Yeah, of course. You know, so I never ask him. And that's why he respects me. He said, this guy is okay. He, doesn't, he never asked me where the gold is. He does respect you so much. He told us uh, the other time when the, we met him. And he said he never expected you to direct a film on him. And, you know, maybe you ask some uh, 15, 16-year-old, they say, who is Fatih Hakim? But they sure know Hadar. But that is, so the, the phenomenon of the film is with a younger generation of viewers. Uh, the numbers are really high. Did you expect that? Not like this. Not, not like, I, I hoped. You always hope. You, al you did a screen test with you. you yeah, I did a screen test. Warner always do, you know, since I, I, it's my third film with Warner, and I always do it. And a lot of directors don't want that, mm -hmm. you know, but, but I appreciate it. I like it, you know, because for me, cinema is something in the tradition of Charlie Chaplin. You know, for me, something cinema is, is, 
you know, in a cinema, you have a lot of seats. That's the opposite between a home. You know, you, a cinema is you have 500 seats, 400 seats, 200 seats. I don't say like an art house film has to fill 500 cinemas, you know. Maybe an art house film just fill in 10 cinemas, or, but then each seat has to be filled. This is my definition of cinema. And, uh, and, uh, um, Sorry, I lost this. this part. There was a test screening. With your, ah, with a test screening. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Warner is doing these test screenings, you know. And uh, and I want to know how my film works with the test. I don't have to go for like the, the 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 test. Warner is doing it for the marketing. For me, it's enough to sit with the crowd. Then I know exactly the film is too long there. The film doesn't work here. This is not funny. You know, uh, this is too long. I can. I need the crowd to see that, otherwise I don't see it. Mm -hmm. And what did your son say? My son, uh, who was uh, 16 or 17 at that time when, when I showed him the film, I was like, hey, go to your class and I, I, want, I want them to see the film, on a very early stage. And he was a bit nervous because uh, he thought like, if I fuck it up, it would be embarrassing for, for his classmates, you know? So, uh, and they liked it. And he was so relieved. He was not really proud, you know. We, we are not. We don't have that relationship. But but he he was like very relieved. Okay, Daddy didn't fuck that up, you know. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Good, yeah, you didn't mess up with the with the with the idol, Ushata. Did you? Um, were you sure that you're gonna keep a specific position on him, despite any judgment, any morale? Look, the problem, you know yeah, the problem in German cinema is um, because it, it works a lot with state money and funds, there's always this question of moral, you know, and judging and, you know, have a didactic or pedagogic perspective on things. And I don't think cinema works like that. You know, I don't think Almodovar cinema works like that. I don't think, I don't know, Jacques Oriar cinema works like that. Not at all, especially Jacques Oriar not, you know, because the bad guys always win in Jacques Oriar, yeah. you know. So, um, and I think it's boring to have this morality. I think audience and kids, it's not the, it's not the job of the filmmakers to teach someone, it's the, it's the job of the parents to teach their kids, you know. And this is popular culture in a way, or art, I don't know how you want to call it, you know. So... My point was, I don't want to judge it. I don't want to glorify it, you know. I need a certain distance. The way when I use distance is with humor. Humor is for me important too, to have distance. You can have distance like Uli Zeide does, like have the camera away and you observe, you know, and this is the way you have the distance. Clinical. Clinical, you know. Sometimes it's not very entertaining, you know. It has, it has something, of course. It's strong, but it's another thing. I need a distance as well. I don't want to lose myself in this world, but my way of distance is like humor. Humor for me is a good trick for myself to have distance to the material. You talked about the job of uh, the director, the school, the parents. What is the job of the critics? Um, critics are like, hey man, critics are like weather. It's like the weather. You never know what happened, you know. You know, sometimes... You, you, you think it will be sunny and you go out without an umbrella and it's raining and you get wet, you know. And sometimes you expect the rain, you know, and then it's sunny, you know. It's, um, it's, uh, it's something which is absolutely out of my control. Yeah, but the reviews were weird about this film. In Germany? Yeah, in Germany. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I have my theories on that, you know. I... Look, the, the image of the, of, the, of the reviews are very bad, you know. When you really analyze, like, I don't read them, you know, but my wife does. And, and, and she told me, like, hey, there's a good one here, there's a good one there. I count them, it's more good one than negative ones, but the negative image of the film is stronger, yeah. you know, for, for certain reasons. I think the film is a bit, like hip-hop always is, a mirror for the German society. Yeah. Hip hop, rap music is always a messenger, you know, and sometimes certain critics in Germany 
You know, they don't, they don't, they don't like the message, and they kill the messenger. So, like, hey, if you have a problem with this world, you know, ask yourself why is that? You know, because rap music will always exist when you have rich people and poor people. Whenever this will happen, whenever you have poor people, there will always be rap music. You know, this is the voice of these people and of a young generation. And certain people, they don't like these messages, you know. They're too conservative, they're too old, you know, and they hide themselves from the message. But, and then they kill the messenger. But I'm just the messenger, you know. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Always is. Thank you. And it's better when we talk here in Greece than uh, Germany. Berlin Film Festival is so stressful. It's everyone. It's yeah, when, you know, it's, um, the cinema should not, look, I respect all auteurs and art house and everything is legitimate, you know, but, um, but it's, in a way, the cinema had turned, because of the streamings, because of the changing of everything, you know, the cinema had become, and it should not become, an elitaire, bourgeois bubble, which had completely lost the connection to the audience, yeah. you know. This should not happen, you know. And I'm, and I'm also speak about, I want that people see Almodovar films. Mm. I want people see Uli, Weide, Uli Seidel films. But if it gets into this elitaire bubble, it's out of, it's out of, it's not connected anymore. And the idea of cinema is it must be a connection with the audience. That's the concept of cinema. That's why you have so many seats in the cinema, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but it's a change, you know. And and my film, in a way, was also made with that purpose. Like, okay, I have to be in opposition to the bourgeois. It's it is a completely psychologically complicated thing. It's the changing of the, it's, it's something evolutionary in a way, but very fast, I guess, and not very, uh, I think it's toxic in a way, because um, COVID made it faster, but it's not the reason. It's like there's this uh, uh, development to individuality. Yeah. Everything now is indiv individual, not individuality. We, we don't go to the shopping malls anymore or, or to the supermarket. We just press this and everything comes. We don't go to the bookstore. We don't mingle with people. No, we don't go to the bookstore or the record store. You know, we, we go on Amazon and the book and the record or whatever you need, the, the uh, uh, um, uh, everything yeah, sure. is, is coming, you know. So uh, same with food. We don't go to the restaurants, we, we order the pizza, you know. So same with the cinema, you know, and, and the theaters. And human beings, we always, we came to what we are because of narrative. We create a narrative. How, how did we do it? You know, we brought the people together always. That's the story of the human, mankind. And this development now is against that community and society thing. You know, that's what's happening, you know. And that's what I try to be, I try to be a voice against it. 